Hi everyone and welcome to our very first screencast and today's topic is going to be on homeostasis. Now you can't really talk about homeostasis without first talking about the second law of thermodynamics. It's one of the most fundamental laws of nature and what it states is that everything in nature is always moving towards the direction of increasing disorder. And I know you can probably think of a few examples of increasing disorder in your lives. So that's what nature does. Everything moves towards being messy. But life is very opposite to this. Living things on the inside have to be very organized or else they wouldn't be able to survive. This is one of the main things that separates living things from non-living things. Living things are very organized internally. Now homeostasis means to stay the same, to stay the same inside internally, chemically inside your body. The classic definition is the ability of life to maintain a constant, stable, and very organized internal environment. So make sure you know that definition in your own words. And along with evolution, which you probably learned in grade 11, that's one of the guiding principles we talk about in biology. And even the very most simplest forms of life, like this amoeba, have a very different internal environment from the environment that they're swimming around in. So I'm asking you, why do you think that is? Why do their insides have to be so different from their outsides? Let's watch this amoeba moving. Now this amoeba, you can see, is streaming its cytoplasm and it's forming a pseudopod, which you may have learned last year. That definition isn't important this year, but just looking at the internal environment of this one-celled creature, you see here that there's a paramecium, a smaller creature, um, coming near the amoeba and the amoeba is engulfing it, basically eating it. And you can see, if we go closer into the insides of the amoeba, this paramecium has now been locked inside a small vesicle, which is called a food vacuole. And what will happen is this paramecium will be completely digested and absorbed into the body of the amoeba. So take what you know about that and try to figure out why the insides of the amoeba have to be so different from the outsides. We'll talk about that in class some more. And then I want you to think about you go from a very simple creature like an amoeba and that very simple creature has ultimately evolved into different things like frogs, birds, and even chimpanzees and creatures like us. And alternately gone a different route in evolution to become things like plants and other living creatures. And the more complex a life form gets, the more efficient and elaborate the homeostasis has to be in order to allow that animal to survive. So in humans, we basically have completely separated as much as possible all of our cells from the external environment. So we've improved the quality of our internal seawater. And if you think about what's inside our bodies, we've got not only do we have blood, uh, which our blood cells and other, other liquids travel down, we've also got our cells and in between the blood and the cells is this interstitial fluid and all three of those will have distinct um, chemical situations inside them and what we've done is we've evolved physiology which allows us to both monitor and adjust our internal environments and that has to happen within very narrow parameters it can't go too high and it can't go too low if you ever see a graph that looks like this that is a homeostatic graph. So it goes up a little bit, down a little bit, it corrects itself up and down, but doesn't ever go beyond those parameters. And in order for homeostasis to work, you have to be able to sense a change in your body. So it's receptors that do this, they monitor changes that happen in your body. So some sensors monitor temperature, some measure blood pressure, some measure how much sugar you have in your bloodstream and how much salt you have in your bloodstream as with osmolarity and some measure the pH how acidic or basic your blood is and when you're measuring osmolarity you're checking for blood pressure 
Now these monitors can't be isolated by themselves. We have to link them in some way, usually by a nerve or a hormone, to a mechanism of part of your body that can actually help to correct that change. And when you link a receptor to a corrective mechanism, we call that a feedback loop. So in a feedback loop, usually you'll get some input of information that will turn the system on and when the system is on it causes a change an output and many times that change will then turn the system itself back off again it will stop the system from being turned on there's actually two different types of feedback loops there are negative loops and positive loops we're going to start first by learning about negative feedback loops this is the type of loop we actually talk most about in this class and this is the type of feedback loop where the output of the system will actually inhibit itself or shut itself off when it gets to a certain point. And the best example of that is a thermostat in your house. When you have a furnace in your house, if your house is cold, then the thermostat will turn the furnace on. The furnace turns on, it gets hot. When it's too hot, when it's at a certain temperature, the thermostat will turn the furnace off and shut itself off at a set point. Then of course it'll cool down again and then the furnace will turn on again. So when the heat increases, when it gets hot, the furnace shuts off and when the heat decreases, it gets cold, the furnace is turned on. Very similar happens to the body with the negative feedback system. So if we're talking about temperature in the body, the part of the brain that controls temperature is the hypothalamus. Now in this system the hypothalamus is the control center and the control center receives information th from thermoreceptors, heat receptors, thermoreceptors both in the blood that detect blood temperature and in the skin that detect external temperature changes. Now there's many different things that the brain can turn on like smooth muscles in the arterioles in the blood, sweat glands, um, the muscles that control the hairs in your skin skeletal muscles that control your shivering and glands in your body that can control your metabolic rate. Now the hypothalamus is going to want to maintain a set point of around 37.5 degrees Celsius. That's true in most mammals and it's going to regulate that within a high and a low set point and that will allow the temperature to rise by 0.5 degrees above 37.5 to 38 degrees so it can get as high as 38 degrees and still feel comfortable and as low as 37 degrees so up 0.5 and down 0.5 and your body's not going to want to get it much higher or much lower so if you heat up then your body will initiate mechanisms like sweating to cool you down if you're too cool your body will initiate things like shivering to warm you back up again now whenever a change occurs in your body this type of a corrective mechanism will start and that is all to try to bring you right back to normal. So how does this work? It works within a cycle. This is a negative feedback cycle. It starts with a stimulus. A stimulus or a change turns a receptor on. A receptor will send a message to usually the brain, the regulatory center, the regulatory center will send a message to something that can affect change. Now usually an effector is a muscle or a gland, a gland that makes hormones. And like I said, the regulatory center is usually the brain, although sometimes it can be a different part of the body. Now once the effector, the muscle or the gland is turned on, it can cause a response, a change to happen in the body. That change will bring you back to normal and once you're back to normal, the receptor doesn't need to send the message anymore. So it will stop sending the message, it'll shut off the signal, um, it won't be sending the message to the brain anymore. Let's see how that works with an actual example. So if your stimulus is that you're getting hot, your body temperature is rising above 37 degrees, that will turn on your thermoreceptor, a receptor that controls heat. The thermoreceptor gets the message that the body's getting too hot and sends a message to the control center, the regulatory center. Now in this case, the regulatory center is the hypothalamus in the brain. 
the hypothalamus will then send a message to many different effectors smooth muscles in the art arterioles sweat glands muscles in your skin skeletal muscles and your thyroid gland and all of those are going to be able to affect different changes in the body and the response will be that your arteries your arterioles will dilate and that will move blood to your extremities to try and get rid of the heat in your blood and you'll get all flushed I know some of you have experienced that before when you're sweating you get all flushed so you'll also sweat sweat will help to get rid of the heat and your thyroid gland is going to decrease your metabolism because when you have high metabolism you make a lot of heat so low metabolism you make less heat all of those are going to help to try to cool the body down and as the body gets cooled down it will return back to 37 degrees back to normal and once you're turned back to normal then that thermoreceptor is going to stop sending the message to the hypothalamus and it will shut the system down at a set point at 37 degrees and we represent that with a negative sign on our cycle now sometimes temperature doesn't stay within those parameters one example of that is when you have a fever when you have um, when you're sick with a bacterial infection your white blood cells will actually release a chemical called a pyrogen to increase your body temperature by two to three degrees that will help kill the bacteria it white blood cells work really good at a, at a higher temperature but it also explains why we shiver can you tell me why do you shiver when you have a fever I want you to think about that we're going to talk about that in class now bears and other mammals that hibernate can release hormones that will reduce their body temperature to around five degrees Celsius when they hibernate and that decreases their me metabolic rate drastically so they can conserve their food not burn through their food really quickly another great example of homeostasis is how we control blood sugar levels now just after you eat a meal you get a lot of food in a meal and a lot of that food gets turned into sugar in the bloodstream if you get a sudden spike of sugar in the bloodstream insulin will be turned on and tell the body you know what we should store some of that sugar for later and as the sugar gets removed from the blood your blood sugar levels drop and usually a few hours after a meal you have really low blood sugar then glucagon hormone is released both of these hormones get released from the pancreas and glucagon says okay cells let's release some of that energy we stored earlier release some of that sugar and then you get another spike in insulin so both these hormones are made in the pancreas the pancreas helps to control blood sugar levels in the body other examples of things we control via homeostasis are we control blood pressure this way we control urine formation this way we control metabolism this way lots of examples are going to be talking about throughout the year now those are all negative feedback cycles let's talk for a moment about positive feedback loops or cycles a positive feedback loop causes ever greater changes to happen these changes happen in the same direction they don't shut themselves off at a certain point it just keeps going and going and going in one direction until a change happens so this type of loop helps the body to complete a process. Examples of that are blood clotting. When you get a, a scrape or a cut, you want to clot the blood. When you're digesting proteins in your stomach. When you are going through your menstrual cycle. And birth is one of the best examples of a positive feedback loop. So this type of loop happens when the product of one pathway stimulates or causes another pathway to increase its activity. So ultimately it causes greater change to happen and that change happens in one direction. So a great example like I said is labor. When you're in labor the baby's head drops and it starts pressing on your uterus. That stimulates the that pressure stimulates the brain the pituitary gland to release a hormone called oxytocin what does oxytocin do causes the uterus to contract that makes more pressure more pressure causes the pituitary gland to make more oxytocin and this cycle continues more oxytocin more pressure more pressure more oxytocin until eventually you get a baby and this is my daughter Ella Aww. So just to clarify in a positive feedback loop, the end product will speed up the production of another feedback loop. 
So you have some, and then you get many, many products. In a negative feedback loop, however, when you get an accumulation of an end product, it'll slow the process of that product being made. So you see we've got lots of enzymes being made. Once there's enough enzymes, it's going to shut it down. You know what? We've got enough of that enzyme. We don't need any more. Or we've got enough of this product. We don't need any more of this product. We've got enough, so let's shut this process down. So the end product will actually shut the process down. So, big question for you, which, which one of these processes helps to maintain homeostasis? Is it positive feedback or negative feedback? I want you to think about that before our next class. Make sure you come to class with any hot questions you have, any questions you have that you didn't understand. Fill out your screencast sheet and we'll see you in class.